Hey guys, it's Stephanie here with Georgiana Lee, my wonderful co-facilitator in women's group. And we are gonna take some time here just to have a conversation about some of the questions that I posed on my stories about conscious relationship and shadow work. Mm -hmm. Georgiana, do you wanna take a second and introduce yourself? Sure. Hello everybody, I'm Georgiana. Um, so I facilitate weekly shadow work, sharing circle with Steph Hunter here, and also work with families, work with parents to create strong relationships with their children so their children can feel confident and trust in themselves and the world and thrive. And also work with women, mostly women, on creating deeper self-loving relationships with themselves so that they can move through life with courage and heart. So I guess that's me. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of questions and I'm gonna narrow down two for this segment. Uh, we got a lot of questions about where to begin uh, when it comes to conscious relationship and shadow work. So the short answer for me mm -hmm. is to notice your mind, notice what it gets up to with everything that you encounter. Just a big noticing festival, right? There's obviously next steps, but to me that makes sense for the beginning. Yeah, I mean, noticing my mind has been one of the most impactful skills to practice. I think with noticing our minds, noticing with kindness and compassion, you know, is really important. I think for me, even before that would be, if I think of the term conscious relationship, conscious to me meaning like intentional, right? So I would want to think about what kind of relationship do I want to have with myself? What kind of relationship do I want to have with others? And then do some noticing, like Steph says, notice what kind of relationship I have with myself now and what kind of relationship I have with others right now. And from there, bring some intention to which things you want to celebrate that you're enjoying about those things and which areas um, are presenting themselves as places to grow. Mm -hmm. So I think that that would be where I might start. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that. Yeah. The simple question of how do I want to feel? How do I want to feel in my life? How do I want to feel in my relationships? How do I want to feel about myself? And like, to, to sort of narrow it down or like give some other options into exploring what my relationship with myself is like, what is my relationship like with needing things, mm. with wanting things, the wanting part of me? What about my sad part of me? What's my relationship like with the sad part of me? What's my relationship like with the excited part of me? Or maybe you notice you have no relationship at this moment with those particular parts of yourself and bringing some compassion to yourself, you know, um, when you make those realizations and then bringing some intention to what kind of relationship do you want to create with the excited part of you, the sad part of you, the part of you that has longings and desires. So it can quite feel quite overwhelming if we look at the big picture. And also it might not, I don't know, I just think it helps to discern that we are humans made of many, many parts and we can have differing types of relationships with each part of us. Mm -hmm. And that's so neat to discover when you realize like, oh, there's a mental pathway I've created that tells me that this is the way such and such a thing is. This is the way I feel about something. This is the way I think about something. And to realize that there are alternatives or that we've been constrained by our past experiences and that things might be a lot more expansive for us than we've made space for is yeah. wonderful and overwhelming, as you say. <laughs> I think something that people tend to forget when they wanting to work on themselves with themselves, I'm going to write this down because I might forget. One is like, what is your intention, right? If your intention of learning about conscious relationship is like to fix something that's broken about yourself then we keep repeating that belief that there's something wrong with me and how I do relationships 
right? But if your intention, like what if your intention was, um, I wanna give myself an opportunity to just notice how I interact with myself and others and notice which parts of that light me up and which parts of that are actually standing in the way of me creating the life and relationships that I want. You know, I feel like the result is different depending on the intention that we go into this work with. Mm -hmm. um, there was another thing I was gonna say, but I forget that now. We'll see if it comes back. Well, the intention is a great thing to explore because I think it's rare that people come with the intention of just becoming conscious and awakening to themselves. I think people come to this work because of some tragedy that's befallen them a lot of the time some relationships exploded, something has gone wrong in their life and they realize that something needs to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So holding, I wouldn't say holding your intention close to you, but you can't hold an intention that you're not even aware of. So first coming to some awareness of what your intention is. And then in this discovery process, I think we tend to focus on what I don't do well right now and how I'm going to learn to do that better, which is a great thing to do. It's important, but on its own, not sufficient. Um, and it doesn't cover the whole human experience in that there are certain things you already do well. You know, when relationship has felt smooth to you, even if it's been in like really minute moments, can you look back at what was I doing then? Where did I lead from in that moment? Which parts of myself did I show in that situation um, that led that moment to feel like there was flow and ease and harmony? And we can pull from those moments and make a conscious choice to bring some of that back in to how we're doing relationship or how we are showing up in relationship now. Um, people forget that you already do a lot of things well, right? Or there might be certain relationships that you have where you find it easier to find your flow and your groove and you find that it's mutually respectful. Notice what makes those relationships or those components of your relationships thrive and see if you can bring in some of that into some of the relationships where you're, you're noticing more challenge. Mm. Well, that's a great segue to the next question, which is what's different about conflict in conscious relationship. <laughs> I love that this idea that because we're now in conscious relationship, we will approach conflict differently. Sometimes we will. We will if we're conscious of our conflict patterns right? <laughs> and ourselves. I think, yeah, it's a byproduct, right? We experience conflict differently as we bring awareness to how I show up in conflict, what I make conflict mean, um, what I choose to get out of conflict. I think those have really been impactful in my life. I used to be terrified of conflict. There was so much conflict in my house growing up that I did everything to avoid it. I chose relationships, friendships that would almost guarantee that there would be no conflict. Um, I chose so what, what, what did conflict mean for you at that time? It was just a scary thing, a scary thing to be avoided at all costs. Um, it meant I never could understand that you could be in conflict with someone you also loved, like love and anger, like those two things, I didn't know that they could coexist. So because I wanted love feelings, I was like, I must just chase anything that feels loving and anything that feels like conflict or not loving must be something that I try to avoid at all costs because I didn't know that the human experience is that those things go together and that anger and conflict can come in ways that are just expressions of a state and that they shift and that they, they, those things can be expressed without it damaging a relationship. Um, so I really had to learn that. I had to grow my muscle in learning how to create a different relationship with conflict. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? What did you change? 
And what's your relationship like now? How did I do that? I think the first thing was like allowed myself to have feelings. <laughs> To know that sometimes I feel sad or disappointed, frustrated, angry. I grew up in a, in a, in a home where I was loved, but I didn't feel permission to feel anything and express anything. Um, because I had no relationship with my anger. So like we were talking about relationship with different parts of ourselves earlier. I wasn't allowed to have my angry part show up. And so when I saw angry parts in other people show up, I was like, no, <laughs> which led to the wanting to avoid conflict. And as I got into relationship, as I brought curiosity and kindness to my anger and allowed it to be there and not... And like not make it mean I'm a bad person or a not loving person because I feel angry in this moment. Um, it changed just what anger meant to me. It changed what conflict represented for me. Like conflict became, oh, it's two people having an experience. And maybe it feels really uncomfortable for one person or both people right now. And that's okay. We can make it through this. Mm -hmm. right? But I wasn't equipped with that as a child. Conflict only represented someone who's bigger, stronger, louder than me gets to decide how everything goes. Right. And my needs don't matter. And my voice doesn't matter. So who as an adult wants to sign up for more of that? <laughs> Nobody, <laughs> right? So you try to avoid. Um, but I also had to remind myself, like, I'm not five years old anymore with no power. I'm this grown woman who does have a voice and whose feelings do matter, but I didn't always believe that or know that to be true yet. So I had to do a lot of work around those two things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my family, conflict looks like uh, disagreements that we just talk with each other until we either agree or disagree. And then we're like, oh, interesting. We have conflicting ideas, tra-la, lovely, easy, no anger. I was just unaware it existed. So seeing people in angry states to me, it was the same. That sounds like as it was for you. That it's like you can't have love and anger at the same time. So in partnership, you know, if somebody was angry, it was immediately like, "Oh, do you want me to leave? Are we breaking up?" You know. Well, it's interesting that you say that because as you're describing your childhood, I'm like, "Oh, I wish I had that." <laughs> and yet we still had similar experiences with conflict because I think we all make it mean what we make it mean right um but I also didn't know what a disagreement was like like I didn't know that a disagreement is something normal that it's okay that you can still love each other and disagree I thought that if you loved each other you had to agree like in my household it was like you're the child you must respect the elder like that's so somehow it got programmed that if you love, you must agree. Right. And that is like a prison <laughs> to grow yeah. up in, but then also a prison as an adult to keep yourself in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, it actually feels so much deeper and more intimate to me now to have disagreement plus love. You know, that's that's a true agreement. If we're here for each other, we can disagree and we can still love each other. And it's such a disservice to our relationships to withhold that conflict and see where it can take us. Well, when I hear you say, oh, we can have disagreement and still like love each other and be with each other. What that says to me is I can be myself and still be loved. I can be myself and still be a part of something that we create together. I don't get banished because I have a differing opinion. I don't get banished because I lost my temper, mm -hmm. you know? It's so scary to bring that and know, because you don't know, you know, until, it, until you bring it, how it's gonna be received. Yeah, so I think it takes a lot of courage to, you're basically creating a new relationship with disagreement, a new relationship with conflict, a new relationship with anger, a new relationship with having a voice. 
you know, and we're, we're making conflict mean the obvious conflict meanings, right? Mm -hmm. But what about inner conflict? What about when we encounter conflicting aspects of our selves, our feelings, our thoughts, our needs? The most powerful answer I have to that and the simplest for me was the word and. Mm -hmm. I remember it blowing my mind. I don't know who or what or where I learned that from, but like, I can be like scared and excited. Mm -hmm. I can be angry and love you. I can disagree and still want to hear your opinion. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> I thought I had to choose one or the other. And I think some of that comes from conditioning as a child where an adult might be like, well, what's wrong with you? You know, and maybe you have the nerve to say, I'm feeling sad about that. And then someone, if you were to show anything other than sadness, it would be like, I thought you said you were sad. Like, why are you behaving this way? <laughs> you know, so I think we get these messages, not with these poor intentions of our parents, but these, their own discomfort with emotion and that their own lack of realization that the human experience contains so many layers um, that we've been conditioned to think you can only feel one thing at a time. You can only want one thing at a time and you can only need one thing at a time and you can only be one thing at a time. And all of that, just saying it out loud feels so constricting. So for me, learning to embrace and um, has helped with that inner turmoil and inner conflict. Um, a lot of us have been deemed crazy or wrong for feeling or wanting conflicting things or, see, you know, so... Totally. Mm -hmm. So what about some practical on the ground conflict in conscious relationship uh, tips or perspectives? For me, this really is about taking responsibility for ourselves, recognizing that our needs and our stories and our perspectives are our own and not putting that onto our partner, but reclaiming it for ourselves which often can I think look like I need a minute. I need yeah. a minute to deal with myself so that I can, you know, come here in a clear way and have this conflict conversation. Right. So we started this conversation talking about noticing, right? So I think one of the things to practice is noticing when I'm having a hard time. And I don't yet need to be able to discern is it because I'm, is it because I'm feeling sad or mad or whatever that feeling is? I don't necessarily need, need to discern the exact chain of events that led me to feel this way. Just to be able to recognize right now, I notice that I'm having a hard time and get familiar with how your body tells you that through either noticing what kind of thoughts do you tend to have when you're having a hard time? What kind of sensations do I tend to have when I'm having a hard time? How do I tend to feel when I'm having a hard time? What tends to be hard for me to do when I'm having a hard time? Mm -hmm. So bringing some awareness to that so that you can recognize, oh, I'm having a hard time right now. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to add some compassion and acceptance of it's okay, I'm human. We all have a hard time sometimes. Because I think as we get better at recognizing that, then we can also start seeing that when other people are having a hard time and we can give them permission. Like if I give myself permission to have a hard time and that when I have a hard time, it means I don't bring my best. I don't bring my open heart. Then when I see that in someone else, it's easier for me to say, Oh, they're just having a hard time right now. They're not going to be able to access their heart right now. Just like I can't access my heart when I'm having a hard time. And maybe what we need, like you said, is a break. Mm -hmm. Totally. Not try to solve anything when everyone's having a hard time. Yeah, for sure. That noticing of, of what discomfort feels like in the body too. I just want to acknowledge how much time and work that can take and how most of us have been operating in discomfort that we've made manageable right so when we've developed certain ways of being and of handling conflict and whatever it is changing those ways is going to feel uncomfortable as well yes and space for that 
Yeah, I always say to people who I work with, and I've had to live this myself, is we're here. One of our primary lessons here in doing this work is learning how to create a different relationship with discomfort. When we know how to bring kindness and patience to our discomfort and acceptance, then like that frees you up for so much more in life. Mm -hmm. We don't walk through life trying to avoid anything that causes discomfort or could potentially cause discomfort. And that takes time. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to give yourself time. Mm -hmm. um, and any people who are able to speak about their experiences about now having more, feeling more skillful in that area, have dedicated a lot of time <laughs> practicing and yeah. stumbling and feeling like you're moving forward and falling backwards. And so giving yourself grace and time and asking for help and support, I think is important. Yeah, it's not a straight line. I think we'd like answers and we'd like uh, final decisions and we wanna know what's up and that's a moving target and that's okay. Yep, it's okay to have a hard time. It's okay to not know the answer. Those took me a long time to learn. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like that for the end of this bit of conversation. Sounds we'll good. We'll talk more in the future. Thank you. Thank you.